It gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Doina Prekup, uh, a good friend and a, and a colleague, uh, now at DeepMind as well. Um, Doina does more things than it seems humanly possible. She's, um, at, she was an associate dean at very recently the Faculty of Science at McGill University. She's part of this Miele Institute that you'll, um, she, you'll see on her title. Um, she's a Canada Research Chair in Machine Learning. Um, Canada has this wonderful way of supporting academics. We Americans should learn from that. Um, and she's also a senior fellow at this very influential um, organization in, in, in Canada called CIFAR. Uh, sort of the, arguably, the organization that led to all this deep learning uh, boom that we're seeing right now. Um, Doina has worked on many, many different topics and foundations of reinforcement learning. Um, and uh, we are fortunate that we're here today about uh, building knowledge, uh, which is a, a topic that I talked a little briefly about in my talk as well. Uh, but Doina is probably most well known for incredibly beautiful work on temporal abstraction uh, in, within reinforcement learning. Uh, an idea of options and, and, and hierarchical reinforcement learning. And so um, th this is a long body of work that has, has great influence within, within reinforcement learning. And I think this building knowledge essentially builds on, on some of that sort of work. So with that, please welcome Toyna. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you for the invitation to be here. I've really enjoyed the last couple of days uh, at the University of Michigan I was here almost 20 years ago for, uh, for the single time that I was here before, and now I'm thinking that I should come more often and, uh, and talk to people because there's lots of interesting stuff going on. Um, so I'm going to start by telling you about stuff I'm not going to talk about um, because I was looking at the theme of the symposium and it looked like there's a lot of applied perhaps emphasis. I know there are people here who are thinking about applications. I'm really not going to talk about applications of AI, although I do a lot of that work actually in the context uh, of, of my job at McGill. Uh, I've worked on medical imaging. I've worked on uh, predicting from time series that are drawn from uh, the ICU, cardiorespiratory time series data analysis. Uh, I've worked with industrial partners or doing reinforcement learning in the context of, let's say, optimizing power plants and things like this. I'm really not going to talk about that, but you can ask me about that later if you want. Uh, what I want to talk about is, is more foundational, and it's really more about core ideas in reinforcement learning and the implications of this uh, for, for AI and for knowledge representation. Um, now, Satinder, uh, in his talk this morning, actually set up the scene pretty well uh, for me to talk about reinforcement learning. So just to remind you a little bit, reinforcement learning is about learning from interaction with an environment. And a lot of the ideas actually have come from uh, psychology, from animal learning theory, from neuroscience, right? This idea that you can have an agent, here there's a little mouse, it's interacting with its environment, it's, it's provided with a reward signal. In this case, the mouse wants to get a food pellet. And so in order to do that, it perceives the state of the environment and it takes actions. Um, and once it finds the right sequence of actions, it, it gets its reward. And so that reward is going to strengthen the desire to do those actions again in that particular context. And so that's exactly what we do in reinforcement learning. We consider agents, these are automated agents, could be robots, could be agents on the web, right? Could be a power plant controller, whatever you want. They're situated in an the environment, they perceive the state of that environment, they can take actions, and as a result, they, they receive numerical rewards. And sort of simplistically uh, speaking, the goal of the agent is just to maximize the expected long-term return or, or sum of rewards that it gets. Um, okay, now why is this exciting? Well, in some sense, it's been exciting because it leads to surprising successes, even though it's a very simple and kind of clear idea. So, you know, poster child success perhaps has been AlphaGo, developed at DeepMind, which is this Go player uh, that learns from data, from interacting with its environment, to become the best Go player among people or computers. Um, and so in this case, it's quite easy to see how this problem maps into a reinforcement learning framework because we can think of the perceptions of this agent as, as the state of the board, seeing where the different pieces are, white, black, and, and no piece. It's easy to represent that in the agent's head. We can think of the actions as just the legal moves that, that uh, conform to the, the rules of the game. And we can think of the reward in very pure terms as just plus one if you win the game and minus one if you lose the game. 
right? So there's nothing else. We don't need to think about heuristics. We don't need to think about, you know, counting pieces or what board configurations are favorable. We just allow this agent to play lots of games, getting this plus one, minus one reward at the end of each game. And from that mountain of data, the agent learns to associate the actions that it's taken in certain situations with positive outcomes, and it strengthens the desire to do the actions that are leading to more positive outcomes. So this agent was, played, uh, was, was trained by playing games against itself. Okay? That is kind of surprising, but it's a cheap way to generate lots of data. Of course, in this case, you know, it's a game, and, and, and uh, we can do this easily. Um, and so it trains inside its, its brain a representation of how to choose actions. That's called a policy. And it also trains uh, a value network. And this value network is just trying to predict how likely the agent is to win. Okay? And so basically, the agent is going to try to strengthen its desire to take actions that lead to winning positions. And interestingly, because this agent is trained from data and from self-play, without necessarily imposing heuristics or imposing uh, sort of biases from outside, it learns and it invents new ways of playing that seem superior to what people do. And that's in some sense uh, the beauty and perhaps also the thing that frightens people the most about reinforcement learning is this potential for these agents because they interact with their environment and they experiment with their environment to learn something that we actually don't know. I find that incredibly exciting, you know, but uh, everybody has their own opinion about that. Okay, so now, you know, reinforcement learning has been studied for many years. There's a sub-community of us who really love it. Uh, I am actually very interested in general AI, right? And, uh, you know, reinforcement learning is a particular formalism, so what I'm going to try to do today is to discuss in what way ideas from reinforcement learning can actually help us build real AI systems. Now, you know, oftentimes when people talk about AI, they think of smart things like Go and chess and so on. I think about cooking, okay? And I really like David's videos this morning, right? Cooking is an interesting activity because we all do it with varying degrees of proficiency. I'm really bad at it, right? So from a very pragmatic point of view, I would like to have a system that does the cooking for me. Uh, but also, it, it's very complicated, right? There's... Uh, Lots of data of different types, right? Stuff can go wrong. You know, things spill and they burn, and you might, you know, not have an ingredient that you really need, and you need to sort of, you know, go to the store and get it, and the cat might walk on the table. There's lots of things that can go wrong, yes, yet somehow are very resilient with respect to those perturbations and non stationarities in the environment, and we're able to, to fix problems, okay? And, um, and we learn how to do it, and we learn this efficiently from one stream of data. And, and if you learn how to cook a recipe, that doesn't mean that you've now forgotten how to cook other recipes or how to ride a bike, right? But with an AI agent, the, these abilities are not there yet, right? An AI that learns how to cook a cake might actually forget how to make soup because, you know, this knowledge has not persisted in its head. It's been replaced by something else. So that's really the thing that I'm trying to work towards, is, is trying to figure out ways to build knowledge in these agents that persist over time, that are not forgotten catastrophically, and that can be learned efficiently from a single stream of data that, that the agent's experiencing. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to encourage people to ask questions as I, as I go along, uh, because there's different sort of uh, pieces to this puzzle, um, and, and it's nice to have that as more as a conversation. Now, I want to base this in reinforcement learning, right, because of this desire to learn from interaction from one stream of data. And so in order to do that, we're going to take a quick look at what kind of knowledge does AlphaGo have, okay? And there's really two kinds of knowledge in, in, the, in AlphaGo's head, right? One is the policy, right? And the policy, you can think of it as procedural knowledge, right? Knowledge about how to do stuff, in this case, how to play the game of Go. That's all it knows, right? Um, and so we model this as a probability distribution of actions conditioned on state. And then there's another kind of knowledge, which is more predictive knowledge, right, which is this value function. And the value function predicts what's the likelihood of winning the game. Um, so that's one kind of predictive knowledge. But in general, we might want to have lots of different predictive knowledge, right? I might want to know that if I'm going to drop the remote, it's going to uh, fall on the floor and it's going to make a big bang, right? 
or I might want to know that if I walk out of the building, I'm going to find uh, you know, the, the uh, computer science building. So we want to build lots of different kinds of predictions about the world, and we want to learn procedural knowledge about different ways of behaving. So that's what we're going to try to do. Um, but we're going to really ground it in this idea that reinforcement learning algorithms already have some ways of expressing this kind of knowledge through policies and value functions. Um, and so we're going to try to focus on procedural knowledge through this lens of goal-driven behavior or learning skills or, or learning abstract actions. And we're going to think of predictive or empirical knowledge in terms of learning models that are like value functions but that can predict many different things. Now, there are three things that I would like to see in the kinds of knowledge that we build. One is that it can express lots of different things. The second one is that it should be uh, learnable from data without uh, labels, without close supervision, right? Without ha requiring constant interaction with a person because, you know, it's just hard to get that. Um, and then the third thing that, that would be nice to have is composability, right? So the ability to learn different pieces and then quickly put them together uh, to provide solutions to new problems that you haven't seen before. So we're going to talk about first about procedural knowledge and then about predictive knowledge, and I'll tell you sort of how I think about modeling these things with, from the point of view of a reinforcement learning paradigm. And so in terms of procedural knowledge, where I'm going to, to think about this from this lens of options or temporally extended actions. Okay, so what's an option? An option, you can think of it as a controller that starts and stops. So there's some conditions under which we can initiate this particular action. We're gonna call that an initiation set or a precondition. Uh, there's an internal way of picking primitive actions or an internal policy, which is here denoted pi omega. And then there's a termination condition and that's a probability of terminating this particular course of action at any given state. So, you know, traditionally in robotics, people have used behaviors, right, or controllers written by hand that start and stop. That's a generalization of that idea. It's also a generalization of ideas from classical AI like macro actions, which are simply sequences, open loop sequences of actions, but here you, you really have policies that, that have uh, full capacity. So what does decision making look with options? Well, it actually looks just like in a reinforcement learning problem. In reinforcement learning, you're at the particular state, one of these dots. Uh, t you pick an action, there's one time take, you, you transition to another state. With an option, you're at a particular decision point, one of these circles, okay? You pick a, an option, and that lasts for some time and terminates. When it terminates, you have another decision point. Okay, so all of the algorithms that we've developed in Markov decision processes and reinforcement learning to deal with decision making and, and, and with learning from one stream of data, we can just readily take them and put them uh, to use options and, and that works all fine. Okay. Um, now more generally, you can think of options as a kind of behavioral program, right? And that's something that's buried somewhere in my PhD thesis at UMass that don't many people think about. But instead of thinking of these simply as Markovian policies, you can think of them as little programs that have internal state that keep track of variables such as the time that's elapsed since I initiated doing something. Um, and, and then uh, they compute actions, right? That's the output. And from this point of view, actually, it's very natural to also think about these as uh, options invoking other options. So you can have as many layers as you want, right? Just like you have in the library, subroutines that call other subroutines or functions that call other functions. Um, and there is, uh, you know, there's different modes of execution, right? The traditional way that we think about it is call and return. You call an option, it terminates, then you make another decision. But there's actually lots of other things you could do. For example, you can have interruption if there's a particularly salient external event. You could just interrupt what you're doing and, and uh, continue in some other way. So all of this, right, this discussion of behavioral programs has to do with syntax, right? How do I write the program that, that executes actions? Um, but in programming, you also need semantics, right? And the semantics need to be well-defined, and ideally the semantics is what gives you composition, the ability to, to understand what's going on when you, when you run programs. And so for us, option models provide semantics, and option models are very much like models of primitive actions and reinforcement learning. They make predictions about the reward that will be received, and they make predictions about where the agent will end up. Um, 
And so we're gonna talk about this more a little bit later, but essentially we think of models as predictions about the future. And using these predictions in planning and in driving the behavior actually has interesting benefits. So this is a, a little experiment that Matt Botvinnik and, and his colleagues uh, carried out uh, a few years back where uh, they had a little agent in a, in a grid world like this. The agent has to navigate to some goal and they're looking at the agent's ability to solve this problem when it can only consider going up, down, left, and right. So that's what the flat curve there is, right? It's just using little primitive actions. Or the agent could have uh, options that actually take it to the hallways and it could generate behavior using these options by calling an option and, and estimating what its value is. Um, and that's this, this orange curve here. That's a little bit better, okay? Um, or the agent could actually also learn models for these options that predict what will happen at the end of the option and use those models in its decision-making process. And that's this bottom curve here. And so the models actually bring you some benefits by their ability to predict in a jumpy fashion over time that goes beyond just having behavior that is hierarchically structured. And that's kind of interesting because I think in a lot of the more uh, recent reinforcement learning uh, work that, that uses options, this idea of using the models really uh, has somewhat been lost and a lot of people focus on the the, the use of options as a way to organize behavior hierarchically, but, but the models are actually quite important. Notice also that uh, the scale of this graph here, right, is a log scale, right? So the differences between these, these different curves are actually significant. So that's one benefit of, of using this type of procedural knowledge uh, sort of together with this predictive knowledge is that we can get faster learning, right, and, and better behavior more quickly. Now, one of the, the, the questions that a lot of people have uh, struggled with over the years is uh, how should we create the options, right? Where do they come from? And in the initial work, uh, you know, by and large, people just gave these things, you know, programmed them by hand. Uh, a lot of the robotics work using options has been done like that. Uh, of course, if you have some kind of secondary reward structure, perhaps intrinsic rewards, like the stuff that Tinder talked about in the morning, um, you could actually learn options uh, by optimizing these, uh, these rewards. Uh, but in general, there's an interesting question here, which is what is a good set of sub-goals or options, right? And you can think of this as a re representation discovery problem. We would like to sort of chop up an agent's experience into parts that are somehow easy to reuse from a procedural point of view and from a modeling point of view. Um, so a lot of people have studied this uh, over the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, one of the interesting ideas that many people have, have worked with is this intuition that what you want is to discover these bottlenecks in an agent state space. So what does this mean? It means that if an agent is circulating in some part of the environment and there's one state that it always has to go through, to go to some other part of the environment, that's an interesting state, right? And you know, maybe some of these intuitions have been driven actually by the original experiments that, that we did in the options framework that, that had this kind of structure, but it's also a kind of structure that people uh, in psychological experiments seem to, uh, seem to uncover uh, when they're faced with many problems, for example, on the same map. Um, so there's been lots of work on trying to figure out these bottleneck states, uh, a lot of it very beautiful, relying on, on graph structural properties, uh, but unfortunately doesn't scale well with large amounts of data, right? Partly because in order to find bottlenecks, you need to construct transition graphs, and transition graphs scale poorly, uh, right, when the agent sees lots of states. And so uh, we've tried to look at alternative cheap ways to, to try and construct options, and this is one very simple alternative, which is just to generate randomly, okay? Um, now, this might seem like a crazy idea, okay? So we, we, we tried to understand if this could work, and this is just an illustration. It's a 2D little navigation task. You have an agent that has to get in sort of this area up here, okay? And uh, it can use primitive actions. If it uses primitive actions, it, it's very hard for it to get out of its initial corner, right? Because when it's doing exploration, 
you just have a lot of random little choices, and so the agent is kind of thrashing about over here. The alternative is just to put these lily pads around the environment in random places. Okay? And the way you think about these is from the vicinity right, of, of one of these centers, the agent knows how to get to the center. Right? And that's because it's a small enough vicinity, right? That maybe you have a beacon and the agent immediately sees the beacon. And so if we look at using these lily pads, right, the exploration problem just becomes much easier, right? And so the agent, with the same amount of experience as this agent here, is actually able to find a path to get to where it needs to be. Now, it's not the optimal path, okay? Because really, we've put things at random, right? So we can't hope that this agent, which is only using the lily pads, is, is, is actually uh, going to be optimal, but it is a path, right? And so this is a kind of interesting trade-off that we have in hierarchical reinforcement learning agents, this ability to solve a problem quickly, not as well as an optimal policy, right? but presumably much quicker and with less data. And that's what we would like to see some more of. Um, Okay, now there's another, there's another idea, which is to just try to do what a lot of DeepRL has done very successfully, and that is to leverage the power of gradient descent in this process. So rather than having some different process that is proposing what the knowledge representation should be, let's just do gradient descent as much as we can. And so that's an, ex that's an approach that we've explored with uh, my student, Pierre-Luc uh, Bacon, who's soon going to be a faculty member at the University of Montreal. Uh, and, and it's called Option Critic. And the idea here was that we wanted to build options that optimize for returns, because that's the one thing that reinforcement learning agents care about. Um, and so in order to do this, we would pose this as an optimization problem and treat it just like any other kind of policy gradient problem and try to solve it by policy gradient means. Um, and so we've built on this very standard reinforcement learning uh, architecture called actor critic. Actor critic is classic work uh, by Sadden and Barto that basically says if you're trying to learn a policy, uh, we can use a value function as a critic that's providing a signal or a gradient to the policy to try to, to move it in a good direction. And so if you have an agent that's interacting with the environment, it's going to learn uh, predictions about the total return, and we're going to use these predictions to uh, make errors, temporal difference errors, and these errors are going to drive uh, the policy using gradient descent, and the actions will get better over time. So it's an interesting framework because it allows us to do continual learning. It can handle discrete spaces, continuous spaces. It's a very uh, sort of flexible uh, architecture. And the only thing that changes if we want to use options is that we need to be mindful of the fact that there's going to be a little bit more structure in the policy, because now the policy has to choose over options, and each option also internally has a policy and a termination condition. Um, and we're going to have a, a behavior policy on top. And then we're also going to need a little bit more structure in the value function because we're going to need to keep track of something like advantages, right? How good is an option compared to the average in a bit more detailed way. Um, and actually, we've even generalized this now further to uh, make a differentiable version that learns initiation sets as well. So what does this give us? Well, this means that now we can have a task that has its own reward, and we can decide that we want to learn some options that, that optimize for this reward and, and, and try to get at these options. And so these are some examples of this agent learning options in this sort of navigation environment. And in particular, in this case, we're looking at the agent's ability to transfer its knowledge between different tasks. So what we do is we train the agent on one configuration of the goal, and then we move the goal somewhere else. Okay. And so this, is, this happens after a 1,000 episodes, and you see this big spike. That's because all of our different versions of reinforcement learning agents are now lost. The goal is no longer where they expected it to be. And then, of course, with enough experience, they will all learn where the goal is again. But interestingly, the agents that are using options are able to do that much more quickly okay, than the agents that are just using primitive actions. So that's kind of interesting. It's one of the, the uses for, for this type of methodology that's, that's been uh, talked about before, 
But there's actually something more interesting about this approach, which is that it can, in certain situations, even work better than the flat approach within a single task. And so these are some example Atari games where we are running option critic. These are these green curves, and we're comparing against uh, DQN, which is a standard reinforcement learning, high-powered reinforcement learning algorithm for learning these tasks. Um, and so what, and, and we have the same amount of experience uh, that we allow these agents as, as what the Q agent, agents would get. And what you see is that these agents get to comparable or better behavior in these Atari games within the same amount of experience. And they are learning more, right? Because they're learning these fragments that can be then reused later, potentially. Um, so that's, that's quite interesting. The other thing that we did is we tried to look a little bit qualitatively at what is being learned. And we can see some interesting structure appear there as well. So for example, in, in this uh, submarine game, we're learning two options that, that trade off against each other. And one of them is essentially the submarine going to the surface of the water. And then the other one is the submarine diving down to rescue a diver that, that, that needs help. And so we can, we can look at the structure that emerges to try and understand a little bit better what this agent is doing. Now, for people who uh, have done reinforcement learning before, of course, we know that, uh, you know, there is, if you have one environment and one reward function and your, your environment does not change over time, eventually there will be an optimal Markovian policy, flat policy, that is the best policy. Right? And so if we run the, this, this particular version of the algorithm in one task, uh, it will learn options, but over time these options will just dissolve into primitive actions because that's the optimal thing to do. So if we want to preserve the knowledge, this is not quite yet uh, sort of sufficient, we need to kind of encourage our agent to keep the options around over time. And so one of the things that we've looked at is what kind of regularization could we impose in an agent in order to encourage it to keep these pieces of behavior. And one thing that, that seemed quite natural is to think of bounded rationality as a pressure on the agent to remember this kind of structure. Okay. Now, bounded rationality means very different things in different contexts. What we mean specifically here is we assume that decision-making is an expensive process. If the agent has to make a choice, that is expensive because it has to think about it, uh, versus execution. So if the agent has decided on an option, it's just executing the option, that is actually cheap because the decision has been made and now you're just kind of cruising along. And so uh, the idea was to encourage the agent to stick to some particular decision by incurring, you know, by sort of giving it a little punishment whenever it changes its mind. Now, of course, if you have a much, much better alternative, you'll still change your mind because the punishment is not big enough. Um, and so, so the idea here is essentially that deliberation is expensive and we're going to incur a deliberation cost. Um, and so, so we looked at the effect of this deliberation cost uh, on agents that are trained on these Atari games against, the, these are agents that don't do transfer, they're just tra trained in a, in a single game. And uh, the yellow curves here are all the ones that have no regularization and then the other curves uh, use the sort of deliberation cost. Uh, and what we see is that in general, for most of the game, not all of the game, but for most of the game, we're in the situation where trying to encourage the agent to remember its options is actually beneficial in the long run. And these curves here are just log termination rate. That's more like a sanity check to show that the deliberation cost actually does force the agent to not make decisions at every time step. Um, and from a qualitative point of view, these are pictures from a game called Amidar, what you see is that an agent that uh, is not encouraged to persist in its decisions ends up taking lots of little decisions, a little bit everywhere, okay? Versus an agent that, that has the deliberation cost, this agent ends up with long pieces of trajectory where it's sticking to one particular option, okay? And then if we look at where terminations, this is the graph of high termination probability states. If we look at where terminations occur, that's actually also kind of interesting. They occur oftentimes around hallways, because those are places where the agent needs to change its mind, perhaps, which way it's going. And they also occur in an area over here where you often get an enemy. 
And so if you notice, the enemy actually have to switch direction and go the other way. So again, we're, we're seeing some interesting sort of qualitative structure emerging out of, out of these experiments. Now, there's another sort of thinking step that one, one can take, which is to say, you know, why are we optimizing just for a single reward after all? Do we always have to do that? And if we think about what we did with, with the liberation cost, actually, uh, for, for the decision points, we're imposing, we're imposing an extra reward structure, right? Which is these like little penalties that the agent is incurring for thinking about stuff. So more generally, right, we could think of having different optimization criteria for the behavior inside an option and for the termination condition and, and the behavior at the higher level. And so that's a line of work that we've pursued actually at DeepMind that appeared in AI Stats this year, um, which essentially showed that uh, we can take uh, this idea of having a transition model and take gradients of this transition model with respect to any kind of objective function that you might have, and independently of gradients that are taken with, res with respect to the action choices. And so that's an approach that, that we call termination critic, and we've, we've tried to use this to encourage these agents to build options that are predictable, that is options that terminate in a small subset of states, okay? And so this is a set of experiments here, basically looking at uh, the option critic architecture on this side, this is the algorithm that I was showing you before. We look at where this algorithm learns to terminate and it learns to terminate just a little bit everywhere, right? There's a lot of variance in what it does versus this approach that encourages options to terminate predictably, and it ends up with options that are quite a bit more focused in terms of what they try to do. And I think this is really uh, just scratching the surface of this particular idea of what actually rewards should be used to optimize for the different components of an option-based system. So I'm gonna pause there for a bit and take questions because I'm about to switch gears to tell you more about predictive knowledge rather than procedural knowledge. So if, if anybody has any questions now, be happy to take them. Yeah. So when you abstract all the like, uh, primitive actions into options, probably also abstract the states into primitive states into high level abstractions. Uh, you mentioned if you do random uh, option critic or action critic, you will lose the global optimum. How often is that? In, in simple grid world, it could happen. You still hit the global optimum, but you know, in complex world, so what is your comment? Yeah, so, so that, the question is basically having to do with the fact that when we're doing abstraction, we might be losing the optimal solution, and also that it's not just action abstraction that happens, it's also state abstraction. And I think there, there's, uh, there's two answers to this, okay? Uh, one is the theoretical answer. So if you think from the point of view of sort of traditional tabular reinforcement learning, we want to get to an optimal solution, right? Then in some sense, the, we would be happy for options to go away eventually to get the sort of the transient benefit, but then to obtain a, a flat policy. If we think from the point of view of uh, sort of realistic tasks, right? The fact that we have a single MDP that is fixed over time and that is small enough for the agent to experience all of it uh, seems far-fetched, right? It's more likely that the agent is in a very big world, like Satinder was saying, and it's only seeing a very small portion of it. And in that setting, uh, you know, an optimal flat Markovian policy is really not what we're after, right? We, we want something much more subtle. We want an agent that has reasonable capability of solving tasks quickly. Now, we don't have quite satisfactory ways of saying that in a formal manner, and I think that's something that we really should work on as a field uh, to, to sort of formalize that intuition, but that's kind of what we want to get to uh, with, with these kinds of methods. In terms of the issue of state abstraction, there was a time when, when there was a lot of work put into this idea of building abstract states uh, through some ways of, let's say, selecting features and, and so on. Um, in some sense, that's all been swept under the rug by, by the deep learning uh, sort of infusion that's come into reinforcement learning. Right, the state is just going to be learned by the function approximator. It's gonna be you know, emerging out of the data. 
Um, and so we haven't really sort of tried to pin that down anymore, right? Whether that's the right approach or not, it's sort of the, the current state of the art in the field, and, and so that's what we're after. So a lot of these experiments that I'm showing you really are done in the context of using these deep nets with reinforcement learning objectives on top of them. Yep. So what is the difference between uh, future uh, reinforcement learning adoption? Uh, uh, yeah, that's a great question. So. Uh, Feudal is developed by Sasha Vajnavets and, and colleagues, also at DeepMind, and uh, there's a couple different uh, sort of nuances to it. For one thing, it's a strictly hierarchical sort of two-level framework. So you have one policy on top calling sort of workers that are, that are at the bottom level. Um, and there is a, an insulation of goals between these two levels. Right, so the, the, the master knows about the reward in the, in the task, and the workers don't, right? The workers are, are not aware of that, they're just re receiving rewards from the master. There's pros and cons to that approach, uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, the workers only get as good as, as the rewards that they're getting from above, so there are subtleties in the way that the training needs to be done. For example, there's recurrent nets at the two levels, and those recurrent nets have to go at different speeds and so on. So there's some, some sort of empirical subtleties that, that, uh, that, that are related to, to the algorithm, but, but in terms of their spirit, they're quite similar. Okay. There was one other hand somewhere. Hello. Okay. All right, so now let me sort of uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about predictive knowledge uh, that is built in a sort of the reinforcement learning uh, fashion. And, and perhaps this is going to be a little bit more controversial uh, than, than what I said so far, but um, I just want to sort of point out that there is one kind of predictive knowledge that we have been building in reinforcement learning for, for a long time, which is the value function. Okay, now what does the value function say? There's, there's a little bit of math here, but not too bad. Value function basically says what is the total expected reward that I will get over time. And often we have a discount factor here that basically says rewards received now are better than rewards that are very delayed, right? Sort of accounting for inflation or uncertainty in the future or what, what or not. Um, and so this is an expectation, right? In that way, it's perhaps a little bit limited. And it's expect an expectation that's taken with respect to the agent's way of picking actions. That's, that's its policy. And... Uh, with respect to the dynamics of the environment, right? So the environment might be stochastic. And so there is sort of two interesting ingredients here, right? One is there is this signal of interest, which is for us the reward from the environment, right? Which is, which is here in red. And then in blue, we have this sort of time scale over which we're making the predictions, which in this case is typically thought of as a discount factor that's fixed. Um, and that's, you know, maybe a little bit crude, but we're going to try and, and, and relax that. Now, if we do this with numerical rewards, then we can also think of computing optimal value functions. And so an optimal value function is going to give me the value for the best policy in my policy class. Uh, and, and there's lots of very well understood algorithms, both for estimating these values, as well as for estimating the optimal value function. Um, so, why do we like value functions, okay? Well, in some sense, it's because we have great tools for computing value functions. And, uh, you know, one tool is sampling, which allows us to take data, right, and, and do this estimation from data. And another tool is bootstrapping, right? So, bootstrapping is this, this idea that I can compute the value at a state based on values of neighboring states, right? It's an idea that comes from dynamic programming. This is a beautiful class of temporal difference learning algorithms that all leverage that idea, okay? And so that allows an agent to learn from partial trajectories. As the agent is going along, at every single time step, it can learn a little bit about its value function and, and make its estimations better. Um, very often, uh, the, the sort of rebuttal comes, well, this is very simplistic, right? It's one value function about the reward, and, you know, who knows if this is all that we, we want to, to learn about. In fact, we might want to learn many predictions about many different things, okay? 
And so this is sort of what we would like to do, actually. We would like to learn many predictions about many different ways of behaving at many different time scales. This is not a new idea. It's an idea, actually, that comes from the pandemonium architecture, right? From Oliver Selfridge back, back in the day, where he imagined these agents having lots of different little predictors in their heads that are always shouting predictions about many different things, and then a decision mechanism on top. And so in some sense, one way to think about what I'm going to tell you is a way of implementing this sort of general idea, but in a reinforcement learning way. And, and this here is uh, a mass of signals that it's a picture taken from Adam White's thesis at University of Alberta. These are actually signals that are experienced by a little robot, now defunct, called Critterbot, that used to go around its environment and had a lot of different sensors on it. And so we could think of making predictions about the values of these sensors over multiple timescales. And I'm not going to tell you exactly what all these things are, but two things to notice is that, first of all, there is structure, interesting structure in these signals, right? Um, and that uh, different signals corresponding to uh, the same policy actually look quite different, right? So that kind of gives you an inkling that if you had a system that is sensing lots of different things and making predictions about lots of things conditioned on many different ways of behaving and many time scales, there's going to be lots of interesting information in there. And this is all gathered from the agent's experience, from data, and learned independently. OK, now how do we formalize this idea? Well, one way to think about it is that what we want is to estimate general value functions. Okay? And so we're going to generalize the idea of a value function in two important ways. We're going to generalize the idea of the reward into a more general cumulant. And we're going to generalize the idea of the discount into a more general continuation function. Okay? And this continuation function is going to be allowed to depend on the state, the agent state. And so all I did is I took the previous equation, the value function equation, and I sort of replaced rewards by these cumulants, okay? And the fixed gammas by continuation functions that depend on state. Now this is, from a sort of algorithmic point of view, this is a very minor change. And more importantly, we're still estimating expectations here, okay? And because everything stays the same, right, around these two quantities, we can actually still use all of the temporal difference learning methods that, that we have in our arsenal and all of the, the sort of usual reinforcement learning algorithms to try and estimate general value functions. Now, what is different? Well, the cumulant doesn't have to be a number, okay? The cumulant could be a vector, could be a matrix, be a tensor, right? For example, we might want to try and estimate what is the expected state at the end of an option. That would be something equivalent to an option transition model. We can express that by trying to take the expectation of the next state vector at the end of the option, right? So this requires now a, a vector-valued kind of cumulant. Um, the fact that we allow the continuation to depend on state allows us to do things like saying we are not going to discount at all until something terminates and then we fully discount to zero, right? So we can estimate things over varying amounts of time, for example. Um, so there's, there's uh, this sort of idea, uh, as I said, inspired by pandemonium, for, was, was part of this paper on, on the Horde architecture. And since then, there's been actually lots of different ways of thinking about knowledge in reinforcement learning specifically that all fit into this general framework. Okay. Um, so for example, so successor states and successor features. Now, successor states is an interesting idea that came from Peter Diane that basically says at a particular state, rather than thinking about the features of the state, we're going to think about all of the future states that we could see, right? So the knowledge of, of the agent is in terms of these predictions about future states. And, and Andre Barreto and colleagues have generalized this to an idea of successor features. Now, what does this mean? This means that as the agent is going along, its cumulant is going to feed the features that it's getting. The agent is behaving according to a particular policy. And we can think of the discount factor as the usual thing. And then we can learn general value functions that represent these successor features. Okay. And actually, uh, you know, in this particular case, there's an interesting property which we're going to leverage in a bit, 
which basically says if you have one policy and you have a bunch of cumulants, a bunch of Cs, and we're estimating value functions for all of these cumulants, um, and if I want to know the value of some linear combination of cumulants, we can obtain this one shot from the values of individual cumulants. Okay? So if I learn these pieces of knowledge independently, in this particular case, there's an easy way to combine them, just a linear combination, to obtain knowledge about something else. Okay, so that's an interesting idea. It leverages the fact that we no longer have one reward. Of course, we can't optimize over this unless we impose an ordering over vectors. Right? So this really is sort of tied to the idea that we have some fixed basis of policies that we're interested in. But, but now we can learn something that's a little bit different. So more generally, we're going to think of these, these uh, general value functions as building blocks of knowledge, okay? That take in some information about the agent's way of behaving or the policy. They can a continuation function. They take in something that we're going to try and accumulate. They may take in some information about the state, and they produce an estimate. And actually, we can now hook them to each other, right? So I could take a prediction, a value that comes from one GVF, and put it as a state for another GVF or put it as a cumulant for another GVF, right? So we really can think of these as like little Lego pieces that we take and we hook together. And of course, you know, the deep learning lesson, if all these pieces are differentiable, then we can actually flush gradients through everything. And, you know, keeping fingers crossed, maybe something interesting will emerge, okay? What else can we express with, with general value functions? Well, another interesting thing is option models. We discussed a little bit about option models. This is a, a formula here for the reward model of an option. It says we're going to accumulate the rewards that are happening as an option is executing. And then uh, options terminate in, in, in two different ways, right? Either the environment terminates them or they decide to terminate. And so here it's a little bit the flip side. It says an option continues if the environment decides to continue the op that, you know, the agent's still alive with probability gamma and if the option decides to continue with probability one minus beta omega, okay? So here we have a case where actually we have a continuation function that depends on state. And if we allow for this generalization, then we can write option reward models as well as option transition models as general value functions and, and the learning algorithms for these models become special cases of they're just doing temporal difference learning. We can do the same kind of thing for the option value functions, okay? And so this is kind of spelling that out. An option value function says the agent receives some immediate reward, and then it might terminate or it might continue. If it continues, then the option is, is the same, it's this omega. If it terminates, it might switch its mind, okay? And so if we rewrite this from the perspective of general value functions, we get something a little bit interesting Right, which basically says that the cumulant, the cumulant that, that we're working with doesn't only depend on what's happening inside the option, it also depends on how the agent terminates and what are the choices at termination. And that's interesting because it sort of points to the origin of this sort of options shrinking phenomenon. It's a kind of degeneracy where the agent is thinking, you know, each option from its own sort of myopic point of view is thinking, oh, there's so many others that are better than me, let me just terminate right now and somebody else is gonna take care of, of the future, right? And so we kind of see that through, if we look through this lens of, of what these cumulants are. There's actually another way of failure, which we've also observed in, in some cases, where an option just kind of takes over, right? Becomes a dictator, says, oh, I'm better than anybody else, never gonna give control ever again, right? And then just kind of continues forever. So these are all both, both failure modes. And they also point to the fact that perhaps the option value function is not the best thing if you want to transfer knowledge, right? Models may be just much more robust uh, in this kind of context. There's lots of other things, so I could, you know, I could go through this exercise of, of writing things as general value functions uh, for, for some while, but that's not so interesting. I wanted to show you a couple of cases where this actually gives us interesting empirical benefits. And so this is one particular experiment that was actually also done by Sasha Vajnavets, where uh, we are learning a whole cascade of general value functions. The first value function learns to predict rewards. The second value function learns to predict the first value function, 
okay? And then the third one learns to predict the second one, and so on. Um, and so we've tried this on the Atari games. This is an aggregate curve that looks at performance of usual option critic on the Atari games. And this is the approach uh, using the general value functions and we get a significant improvement. And there are some games where the improvement really is quite big. There are other games where things are just sort of uh, about the same. So this is, this is a case where the general value functions really are acting in some sense as auxiliary tasks. Uh, they don't do much as knowledge representation, but they condition the internal uh, features of the agent. And because the agent is learning to predict many different things, uh, our hypothesis we're, we're analyzing that now is that just the features that are being learned are better, okay? Um, there's a different uh, kind of uh, work that we've been uh, doing recently. It's about to appear at, at NeurIPS. Uh, which is using GVFs to synthesize new behaviors. And this is an idea actually that originated with a uh, Barbados workshop uh, with the talk of Rich Sutton, uh, where um, he was talking about how an agent might uh, sort of uh, execute options. And, and the idea was, you know, you could imagine an agent that has a keyboard, okay, and each of these keys is a cumulant that the agent is interested in, right? Hunger, thirst, you know, uh, tiredness and, and so on. Um, and so, you know, one way you can think about it and sort of the traditional way in the options framework is I activate the cumulant because I'm interested in that one, that one takes over, you know, that key is sounding and then at some point something else becomes urgent so I'll lift that finger and then put another finger down. But of course, you know, if you think in terms of this musical uh, sort of metaphor, it would be nice if you could play chords. If you could say, you know, I'm a little bit hungry and a little bit thirsty, so I'll play those two keys together, right? And we would like an agent to be able to kind of synthesize behavior that now satisfies both of these cumulants to the extent that they're relevant. And so the idea was to have, to sort of build a keyboard with different cumulants for these agents, and then to take these cumulants and weigh them and use the ideas behind successor features to, uh, to take those general value functions and use them to synthesize new behavior. And so we've tried this, this is just some illustrative uh, experiments from this paper. In this case, we had agents uh, in an arena where there's a moving target, so the agent is trying to, to go to a particular place and, and as, as the agent is moving around, we're moving the goal around. And so the goal is, is jumping everywhere. And really, the way we can think about this is that the agent actually only needs to learn three options Okay, corresponding to three cumulants in these directions. And then we can sort of obtain everything else by reweighing, right? And we can use positive weights if the agent is encouraged to go into some direction, but we can also use negative weights to tell the agent actually, you don't wanna go towards, towards that specific target because right now there's a predator there or something like this. And so this is a bunch of, of corresponding learning curves. This red curve here, corresponds to just a flat agent learning in this environment uh, on a particularly new task. This green curve here is if we just use options, so just these options, just switching between them. And then these other curves are essentially playing the keyboard, very different versions of playing the keyboard. And that gives us a much, much faster response. So, so we are really thinking now of these general value functions as a way of representing knowledge for, for these agents uh, as in, in fact a very powerful tool for knowledge representation. Um, and, and we use them as a, as a counterpart to options which are, which are the procedural knowledge representation. Um, and and uh, of course it's not fully general in the sense that, you know, if you think back to, to what I told you, general value functions are expectations, right? They're not fully generative models. Um, of course, we could represent, if we needed distributions for something, we could represent, for example, distributions by method of moments, and then we would, again, be in a, in a setup that is very similar to what we're doing now. And, and uh, we, it, there is still a big open question in some sense about how are we going to leverage these general value functions in order to uh, generate behavior. Um, but there's actually an even bigger open question which I want to discuss here, and I've been having some of these chats with the students actually uh, yesterday as well, which is how do we even evaluate empirically the benefit of these kinds of systems? 
Now, in reinforcement learning, we have been used for a very long time to use complex but single tasks, right? Go is a perfect example of that. It's a game, it's a fixed game, the agent gets better, plays the game really well, right? Atari game, sim similar kind of thing. But ideally, what we would like is agents that live a little bit like us in a very big world with a very rich life, right? And we want to evaluate empirically how well they're doing and how much the knowledge that they're building is actually helping them. And so assessing the capabilities of a lifelong learning agent is in some sense uh, a very interesting way to do it. Now, what do we do in, in research papers nowadays? Well, we look at returns. Right? And a lot of the game is getting that return to be bigger and to rise faster. But the return on the task is a very unidimensional, sort of small thing. It doesn't really go at probing knowledge. Uh, the other thing that we do a lot of is qualitative analysis, right? We look at videos and sometimes there is a run that's really spectacular and we get, you know, like these beautiful gates on the cheetah or whatever. And, and uh, you know, the qualitative behavior is great. But that also doesn't tell us, in general, how well the agents are acquiring and preserving knowledge. And so that's a problem of methodology. It's not a problem of reproducibility. It's simply a problem of, of sort of methodology in the experiments. And one of the things that I want to point out is that uh, in the rest of science, there is an approach to doing experiments, which is a hypothesis-driven approach. Okay? Let's say I'm interested to know if an agent that's trained with option critic in the Atari games uh, actually understands a notion of space, or maybe understands a notion of object permanence. Right? How do, would we get at that? Well, we would make a hypothesis. If this was psychology, we would make a hypothesis about what the agent might or might not know, and then we might design an experiment with a very specific goal of testing that hypothesis. Um, but that's not what we do in most of our papers. right? And so I think that's actually an interesting place where we should go, where you know, hypothesis-driven experimentation, trying to figure out what do our agents know, formulating hypotheses, and then designing experiments, particularly with the goal of testing them, is going to be necessary in order for us to understand what the agents do. Uh, the other interesting aspect is that oftentimes in the rest of science, these experiments are not carried out by the person who invents the system. Right? We kind of make an agent and a learning algorithm, and then we also test that agent and that learning algorithm, and there's very little appreciation in the field for testing somebody else's algorithm. Right? But I feel like that's really necessary place for us to go. So I, I kind of uh, hope that you know, some of the people listening here might remember that next time that, that they write their papers. So I'm gonna stop there, and I'd be glad to take more questions. Nada. I'm sure you will hear me. <laughs> I'll repeat the question, yeah. Uh, I was wondering how, I mean, this is all super fascinating, learning knowledge, I think it's the big thing that we need to make this AI agents. And I was wondering how interpretable this knowledge means. For instance, I really like the idea of cascading value functions. How interpretability is related to that, for instance? Yeah, so that's a great question, sort of the, the interpretability of what the agents learn. And there's, there's sort of two, two aspects to, uh, to this. One is, if we think from the point of view of building a system, if that system has components that are independently verifiable, and if we have good composition rules when we put those components together, then we would be able to make some statements about the system as a whole. And so from one point of view, this idea of building sort of behaviors that are independent, building general value functions that are independent, and then putting them together with composition rules, basically allows us to say, if we could somehow certify the pieces of the system, we may have an, an, an automated way to talk about the behavior of the system. It's not the kind of interpretability that most people looking at deep learning think about, right? Many people look at deep nets and they try to understand what is this neuron doing and what's that other neuron doing? Uh, I think what we want to get at is, is a different level, right? Because if you think of you know, trying to interpret, let's say, a doctor's decisions, 
It's not that you're going to put them in an MRI and try to understand what this neuron's doing and what that neuron's doing, right? You're going to try to understand their decisions from the point of view of, you know, here are the things that they considered, and here is how those things compose together in order to arrive at the decision. So I feel like, at the very least, this ability to have pieces to a system and compose them in the same way is going to, in, 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 some, in some way, is going to, to help us. Um, are these agents interpretable? Not exactly, right? I mean, they're reinforcement learning agents. They learn to do things. I feel oftentimes we look post hoc at the behavior and we impose our own interpretation over what the behavior is doing. I think there is a fascinating topic, which is language emergence, that lots of people seem to be interested in in the specific context. So if you imagine having multiple reinforcement learning agents and them needing to talk to each other, then I think we would see some more of this kind of emerging, although I suspect it wouldn't look like what interpretability people are thinking about now. Yep. Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So there is, I think a lot, there's been a lot of push towards more replicability. But a lot of this push has been essentially going in the direction of encouraging open software. Now, open software is great because it helps us all develop things better. It is not the same as the ability to replicate experiments, right? Specifically, if you think of a chemistry lab, you know, one chemistry lab and a different chemistry lab are gonna have different illumination conditions and different cleanliness. And if we can reproduce the same chain of reaction in both of them, then we have some confidence, right? And so from that point of view, actually, I feel that people re-implementing things is really a good idea, even if the software is out there. Because we've also had this experience, actually, with, with some of our students. We did this paper a couple years uh, back reinforcement learning that matters, where we took publicly available implementations and we ran them and they don't do the same thing, right? And so I really don't think that just having the software out there is sufficient uh, for us to say that, that experiments are replicable. We really need to strive to have the ideas be clear and stated clearly, right? And, and in a way where the algorithm is actually clean and, and we can work with that. Rick? Yeah, so, so that's an interesting question, and I think traditionally we've thought of planning as the main way to do composition and the main sort of reason to do composition, but more recently we've been looking at other ways. And so, for example, option keyboard is a way of doing composition that is not planning, right? It's just taking some value functions and manipulating them and computing something on top of them. It's not planning in the sense of, you know, we roll forward a model and then we roll forward another model. And similarly, there may be other ways of, especially in the decision-making space, of putting together multiple general value functions that are not planning. So for example, uh, my colleague Kate Larson, we've been looking at voting mechanisms as a way of aggregating multiple pieces of knowledge in a way that is robust with respect to, let's say, the magnitudes of these different cumulants. So I think I've come to believe that planning is one way, uh, perhaps a very important way of, of doing composition, but by no means the, uh, the only way. Um, 
The other thing is planning is still, I feel, a little bit difficult and a little bit like we have the sort of traditional dynamic programming style planning. We have sample-based planning like Monte Carlo Tree Search. Uh, but there is still an interesting space there which has to do with partial plans, right, and partial models. So what happens if, you know, I just want to make a few predictions and roll those forward, right? That, that ability somehow we, we don't quite have yet. There's, there's some work here and there, but that's an interesting space to perhaps make planning better as well. Yep. Yeah, so, so differential neural computers are one possibility, and there's, there's generally, there has been a, a, bu a bunch of interesting work coming out on program synthesis that is certainly related at, at some level. Uh, I don't think it's necessary, so I try to, to think at a level that does not have to be embedded with any particular technology like the differential neural computer, because it's not clear if that is the answer. Right, maybe it is going to be a answer, but uh, but certainly we may want to have. If the ideas are are, we can keep the ideas general. There may be different ways to implement them, sort of at the technology level. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I um, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna try not to rant. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think we have- Considering that a lot of it is in black box with deep uh, mind CEO designing or underneath. So, so, uh, so the let's, let's sort of break down this into, uh, into the, the two pieces, right? So one is, uh, is, AI or AGI, right? Uh, is it AI or AGI? And I think right now, a lot of the success that we have been having is not general artificial intelligence. It is success of AI in very particular applications where it turns out to be a very good tool, right? So going back to my applied slide, medical imaging is a place where AI has proven tremendously useful because you have messy signals and it's essentially a smart way of doing signal processing. Is that an existential threat? Definitely not, right? I mean, we've been advancing the technology and signal processing and control and so on for many years and that has always been beneficial, right? It helps us understand the world better, it helps us do better in particular targeted applications. A lot of this stuff has been done with a lot of involvement from people and again, in terms of whether sort of the technology is black box or not black box, I think it really depends on sort of the level of analysis that you think about the methods, right? And I think, you know, sometimes we say, oh, rules would be transparent because we can look at the rule and understand it. But if you think back to the expert system era, if you have a system with a million rules, do you understand what it does? Not really, right? Because any rule is in a very complicated context. And so I think it's really, we do understand a lot of what these systems do at some level. And what we really need perhaps in order in particular applications to really trust them is a level of certification, right? Why do I trust my doctor? Well, because my doctor went through a lot of years of medical training during which they went through a series of tests. And so, you know, I trust that process and therefore I trust what they tell us, right? And so I feel like with AI systems, that's what we're gonna need to do. Not necessarily that we're gonna need to take what the system does and transcribe it in natural language in a way that people understand, 
but that perhaps we need to have a certification system, right, like we do for cars and airplanes and, and whatnot, a certification system that people can trust. So that's for specific applications. Now there's the question of general AI versus specific AI. And do we need and do we want general AI? And my own opinion is absolutely we want general AI. Now why? Because on one hand, we want to understand intelligence. It's a, as like Stinder said this morning, it's an amazing enterprise to try and understand intelligence, just like it is to try and understand life. And so AGI is a way we have to understand what are the basic principles, right? What are the important principles? What will it do for us from a practical point of view? I don't know, <laughs> but I'm optimistic that it will lead to development of technologies that we're not even thinking about right now, right? Just like the combustion engine took us to a completely different technological space that would not have been imagined before the invention of this engine. I think AI, general AI, would take us to a completely different technological space. And I'm pretty sure it's not going to be bad, but, you know, that's just me. <laughs> yeah. for with the options, would that, would there be a risk when you transfer that to other environments of, and the agent, you know, taking actions that are um, too, too rashly stepping in, into like a far state? Is, is there like a way that the termination condition accounts for that? I wasn't clear on how that worked. Yeah, so I think there's certainly, this whole idea of doing transfer learning is, uh, its success is predicated on there being structure that is shared among the tasks that an agent would be able to latch onto. And so, you know, if you had tasks that are completely different and you try to learn options in one task and you, then you move to another task, it's not necessarily going to help you, except maybe in terms of exploration, right? Ensuring that the exploration is not sort of stuck in a corner. Um, but oftentimes we do think of there being some kind of commonality, right? Maybe the environment obeys the rules of physics and those, are, those exist in all parts of the environment, right? Or maybe the transition dynamics are the same. And then you would expect that if you learn options, uh, that at least some of them would transfer. Uh, but this is also a very active area of research and, and in many cases people have not quite sorted out all of the benefits and, and all of the implications. Uh, of using these methods, and even from the sort of theoretical analysis point of view, right? I'm showing you graphs because I don't have theory uh, to tell you that this is uh, really a, a benefit in some consistent way. Yeah. There are some patient ways, right? You can do K-learning, the last year's paper from DeepMind. Uh, all the earlier algorithm, Beetle, uh, do you have a comparison of the current method with the patient ones? Yeah, so, so we, a lot of the comparisons that we have are basically between different kinds of uh, reinforcement learning, sort of pure value-based, policy-based reinforcement learning. So we do Q-learning, we do Octocritic. Basically, there's very minimal differences between these different approaches. Bayesian reinforcement learning, uh, we don't compare against partly because that requires a prior, and we don't necessarily have a prior, right, in, in, in some of these tasks. Uh, but there's certainly in other papers, right, for example, EYT has been doing some interesting work in terms of using Bayesian RL-like ideas in order to, to get a transfer and to uncover common structure among policies. Okay, we should stop here. Thanks, thanks, uh, Thank you very much.